Well, one of the sectors in the Indian economy which is always spoken about, and it's um, an area where India has really defined itself internationally, is the electronic space, the tech space, the IT space. But there have been so many concerns as well, not just in India, but around the world. Is there some sort of a winter as far as the IT space is concerned? We're at the India Global Forum meet in Dubai, and we have a, a very special guest, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar, with us, uh, the Minister for Electronics and uh, IT. Thanks very much. Uh, for speaking to us today, Mr. Chandrasekhar, um, you know, you're working on a draft data privacy bill. And this is interesting because what you are trying to do, and this is a change, is that you are looking actively at the possibility of sharing data with perhaps other countries. Mm -hmm. In the past, we had our concerns. So why are we changing this now? So, so the, uh, Vishnu, just to correct you, the, the bill is called the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill. Right. It is a bill that uh, has been made necessary and is important uh, from a government's point of view, after the uh, the nine judge uh, judgment yeah. of the Supreme Court, which ruled that privacy is a fundamental right, and as you know, uh, on the internet and uh, around the technology ecosystem, digital data is an extremely uh, widespread uh, commodity, yeah. and it is it's something that every consumer generates. Uh, to your specific point about transferring data. I want to clarify that that is not correct. What okay. the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill does is to say that data of all Indian consumers are protected by the bill. Consumers, uh, digital nagriks of India have certain rights to their data and that only those data platforms that can respect those rights will be allowed to uh, have access to that data. And even when they have access, that access to the data is purpose limited. It can only be for the purposes of the service or product that the platform is offering. Given this context and given the proliferation of the cloud and the borderless nature of the internet, we have also provided in the bill that the government can notify those jurisdictions which will allow for the rights of the Indian consumers to be enforced. And therefore, data of Indian consumers can be stored in clouds that may be not of Indian jurisdiction. So it's a very simple, it's a very different proposition from saying transferring. Right. The word use is transfer, but the implication of the word is that data can be stored in geographies outside of India. Those geographies will be decided by the government of India. And the criteria for those geographies will be that only if the law can be enforced to protect the Indian consumer in that geography, will the storage be permitted? So what countries would these be? Well, I, th I think we'll see. Now we're looking at our close partners, for example, no, I, the United I think States, these are, these are going Japan. To be, no, no, these are going to be reciprocal conversations, Vishnu. We are living in an age where uh, mm -hmm. we are now talking more and more about bilateral relationships. We are talking about uh, the corridors of technology innovation, corridors of trust. And as we build these corridors of trust and innovation, we will see that on the other side of the corridor, there will be countries that reflect the same values and the same uh, expectations as India has. And those, that, those, that the, the ecosystem of corridors, if I can use that phrase, will, will develop over time. But how do we get over the, the entire paradigm of the need to protect our sovereign interests? For example, during the entire WhatsApp issue, uh, when they were said or other companies were told that you need to set up servers in India, data needs to be stored away, and these are our reasons. Now we have moved away from that. Is that because no, no, we have not moved away from that. And that's why, Vishnu, I, I want to clarify again. Repeat, I'm repeating again. There is no move away from the rights of Indian consumers sure. being protected. Sure. We are only saying that if there is an, another country that says we are willing to protect Indian sovereignty and we will ensure the enforcement of the Indian law to protect Indian consumers will be in effect even in our land and in our jurisprudence, only then will this reciprocity be permitted. And where are we in talks? I mean, are we in talks with countries? No, no. We are will there be a, a digital compact in the G20, for example? I, I think, uh, look, all of this is possible, and I, I don't think we should uh, exclude the possibility of any of these. But the broader thinking here uh, around the world is that the future of the world, the future of the digital world will be built by these trusted corridors where data can move, uh, communities and consumers can move, Technology can move with both sides of the corridor being trusted geographies, trusted governments, trusted systems. And as the Honorable Prime Minister has said in the past, the future of tech have to be shaped by the democracies of the world. 
and therefore I think this is a very important building block on how the future of the technology world in the future will be shaped and architected. And this is going and by to whom? help our economy at the end of the day, uh, digital, the, the transnational flow of data, secure data. Uh, is there a way of quantifying the benefits of this? No, look, the digital economy goal that the Prime Minister has set in front of us as a nation is $1 trillion. Right. We are at about 300 odd billion today. We want to be a trillion dollar digital economy. Yeah. And a very important element of being a trillion dollar digital economy is being a country where data can be stored and processed with trust. Yeah. And data with trust is an important message or important outcome of this legislation and on the ongoing jurisprudence that will be rolled out. So, including this morning when I met with a large number of uh, startups, both Indian, UK and Israel and uh, uh, from the UAE, they were all very appreciative of the fact that we as government of India are building this framework that will allow for more and more investors and more and more entrepreneurs from around the world mm -hmm. to look at India as a jurisdiction mm -hmm. where data can be managed and stored with absolute predictability and trust. You know, you use the word startup and I think we can segue to that part of what I thought would be an interesting point to raise. While the startup story in India has been phenomenal, uh, we are in a bit of a problem now. For example, uh, Zomato, PTM haven't quite been profitable of late. Uh, some numbers indicate that almost 2,000 startups have failed in a finite period of time. So has that startup bubble burst? No, no not at all, not at all. I think uh, it is, it's very, uh, to those who are close observers of the startup ecosystem, uh, failures and successes are part of the DNA of a startup ecosystem. Uh, many uh, f uh, startups will fail. Uh, they will st restart and continue again. Many uh, startups will succeed. That is the very nature of entrepreneurship. That is the very nature of uh, b being a startup. However, it is clear that in the last one year, as the global economy faces these post-COVID challenges and the Russia-Ukraine uh, related impact on the global economy and risk aversion, there will be some cooling off in terms of valuation, in terms of investment momentum and dynamics. Is this a bit of a winter in the startup no, no, space? I, I think these are characterizations that are uh, uh, not appropriate because there, there is no winter or summer here. I think there are, uh, uh, there are, there are paces of the cycle. Uh, there, are, there is a velocity of the cycle that sometimes tends to slow down as risk aversion builds in the global economy. And that risk aversion is building in the global economy not because of the underlying nature or the dynamics of the startup ecosystem, but rather to, to a totally unrelated, unconnected phenomenon of the Russia-Ukraine uh, war. So let's see. I think uh, my own view on this is to people who ask me, I say, look, there is a clear headwind today uh, on the global economy front. Uh, let's see how long that lasts. But on the other side is the absolute truism, which is that for the next decade, technology and the digital economy is going to play a huge role, not just for India, but for the global economy at large. So uh, that that does not change. Uh, okay. There may be a little speed bump caused by a dispute in Europe, but we will get around that speed bump. The other problem, of course, is layoffs in the Indian tech space. 5,000 people from big tech companies in October alone. We've heard about Baiju's and Facebook. This is not just an India phenomenon. Right. But let's talk about your concerns right. at layoffs in the tech space in India first. Look, first of all, I approach this te uh, tech space in the startup space with a clear understanding that this is by its very nature and its very DNA uh, 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 something that is got, going to have ups and downs. Uh, if a certain startup had been built for a velocity of growth with certain assumptions, it is clear that the current headwinds in the global economy are going to cause some corrections in that assumption. So I see startups as being a very, um, let's just say it is part of the DNA of being a startup, of these corrections. And yeah. is it something that makes me happy uh, to see people who are in a startup, who are you know you know unicorn being laid off? Of course not. Uh, is there a w is there a way that the government can intervene? Probably not, because these are talented people. Will find their uh, will land on the on their feet and find their place somewhere else. Uh, but uh, it is not something that is very unusual for the startup ecosystem. You see that in Amazon in the US, you see that in Twitter, you see that in many, many companies all around the world. So it is not unusual. Uh, is it, there nothing the government can do? No, I think have what you we voiced do, your concern no, what, with some of these companies? Of course, we have spoken about making sure that these are soft landings, that they are not just 
and you've done this with Indian companies. Course, Could you name a few of them? Or no, I don't want to name a few of them because these are privileged conversations. But these are broad-based conversations. These are conversations that I, ma I make sure that I speak to the founders, I speak to them and say, look, you, you have an obligation uh, to make them sure that the, these departures are soft, that you give them enough time to find some job, you help them with the finding replacement. And you saw that recently in the OYO case. Yeah where they laid off a lot of technology and engineering staff that they've made an extra effort to try and place them. Uh, I would like them to do more. It is absolutely important that you don't think of uh, Indian uh, employees as uh, you know people that you can just get rid of uh, on, a, on a whim and a fancy. Uh, so I think we have to demonstrate and the government is working with the ecosystem of startups and founders to make sure A, that the assumptions of growth in the next one year are a lot more Realistic. Realistic. That has, has that been the problem? Look. And do we have space to re-employ all of those people who've been laid off? Look, off? no. I, I don't see any problem with re-employment because we are in with a... specific skills. Where would no, they no, go necessarily? Because talent, currently the talent that India is producing... Is more than global the demand. demand. No, 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 no. Actually, there's a deficit. Uh, yeah, the conversation this morning with startups was that we, we lack talent. Right. So, uh, what the government is doing is apart from having these conversations, are also, we are looking at reskilling. Right. So maybe there is an issue where there are people of a certain type of skill where the demand is of a total different type of skill. So trying to give them these reskilled, upskilled kind of opportunities. And the government has spent and outlaid about 460 crores to start a digital platform called the Future Skills Prime. Right. Which will allow for youngsters within the industry to look for alternate skills where they can create these skills so that they get the opportunities where the opportunities lie. Right. So these are all things that we are doing. Now, what about support or budgetary support mm -hmm. for the tech sector? Uh, a, is it needed? B, is it something you're looking at? No, no. We, there's no budgetary support required for... In the next uh, budget? No, I don't think so. Uh, we, But clearly, we have certain strategic uh, uh, areas of focus, for example, to catalyze other areas of the tech economy like deep tech in uh, terms of intellectual property in terms of semiconductor design microelectronic uh -huh. design and you will soon see uh, an announcement or, or realization of the announcement that was made in the last budget of a digital india innovation fund right which will be a fund which will be managed by private investment managers but will be like the niif the national right. infrastructure fund but right. for the technology space to but what end would this uh, be? We, we expect this to be a 2 to $5 billion fund. There's right. a tremendous amount of interest from uh, sovereign firms around the world, including in UAE and the Middle East. We think, uh, uh, you know, to, there is a lot of interest in sovereign funds to invest in the next wave of innovation and the next wave of startups from India. Let's talk about G20. I'd, I'd asked you this earlier, but do you see the possibility of a flagship digital compact? When India talks about D, uh, G20 and... And, and, and telling the world, right, where we stand in terms of our digital economy, what in terms of a deliverable can we expect at the end of G20? Uh, look, we will we will showcase, and the Prime Minister has said this, we will showcase how India has harnessed the power of technology to benefit its citizens. Uh, in the G20, in this conversation over the next one year, it is not about showcasing our entrepreneurs or a multi-billion dollar tech economy. It is also about India stack. Right. How we have built innovation into governance right. and built embedded technology into governance right. and transformed the lives of hundreds and millions of Indians. So we want to, be, uh, Prime Minister has already said that the India stack can be an offer that India can make to the global south to a large number of countries who have been out of the di digital inclusion or uh, technology enablement in their governments or to or their citizens, the India experience and the India stack can give them a quick fire way of accelerating the progress of their own governments and their own democracies and their own countries and their own economies to be a more digitized economy and digitized government. To what end are all of the plans we've been discuss discussing linked to a fluent flow of genuine 5G across the country. India's look, digital transformation needs speed. Yeah, look, 5G is a very important element of uh, our old technology narrative, our technology milestones, and the India Tech-Aid uh, uh, promise and opportunity that we have. It is an extremely important element, as is the Bharat Net, uh, the world's largest rural broadband connectivity. Right. Because both those are aimed at qualitatively increasing the quality of the internet, and also 
creating 1.2 billion Indians online. Right. We are already the largest connected democracy in the world. But with 5G and uh, BharatNet, we will become the largest connected nation in the world, the largest global presence of the global internet. It's an extremely important thing. And 5G takes on importance for a different reason also, Vishnu, which is that we, 5G is the first generation of wireless technologies where we bring to the table right. significant capabilities. And that will be a stepping stone to the 6G uh, roadmap going forward. So that, along with the fact that our capabilities are developed, are you looking at to make the transition to beyond 5G? Look, that the networks of the future. You know, when I started cellular networks in the in the late 90s, everything was a black box proprietary yes. technology. We had imported from Europe, imported from wherever. The networks of the future are going to be open networks that are going to be built on large data servers, servers, open platforms but with virtualization software. Those are all areas that we are very strong at. So the future networks are networks that Indian companies, Indian entrepreneurs can very well architect or co-architect or certainly co-develop at the very minimum. So that is why this is a very important inflection point in the evolution of the internet in India. Number one. Number two, 5G, and I, I like saying this uh, again and again, may be the fifth generation in human wireless technology but it's the first generation of machine to machine. And it creates a complexity and alters the character of the internet in a way that has never been done before. So you'll have sensors uh, uh, collecting data and transmitting it. So it creates a large number of opportunities of use cases in education, agriculture, health, that we haven't even touched the, uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg of. So, in a lot of ways, 5G is an extremely important milestone in the evolution of the Indian tech ecosystem. Let's talk about semiconductors. Um, you know, Taiwan has been a world leader. Yep. We have close relations with them, but we also want to have large-scale manufacture of, of world-class semiconductor chips and things like that in India as well. What is the roadmap for that? Uh, is it a realistic one? For example, the auto industry in India has been very badly hit. The slowdowns in the delivery of vehicles because chips are just not available. What is the, the roadmap for semiconductors? Look, uh, one is for, for us to understand what is going on in the world. What is causing this? Yeah. The conventional wisdom is that there are supply chain disruptions yes. and that is what is causing the shortages. Actually, it is not. It's demand. It is demand. Yeah. Because semiconductor supplies have actually gone up by 13% last year. Yeah. The volumes have gone up by 13%. But because the siliconization and the digitization of almost every category, including the car, yeah. Yeah. which used to have one chip uh, five <laughs> years now ago, it's now it's full of chips. Chip. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you, the demand and the digitization of various categories of products is, is so fast and so in a, at an accelerated pace, the demand for semiconductors and demand for microelectronics is also rapidly growing. Our government's vision on this is extremely simple. It's simple to describe. Uh, there will be a lot of heavy lifting to execute it over time. One is that we want to certainly be a significant player in the manufacturing supply chains. But we don't want to compete necessarily with the Intels and the TSMCs in the cutting edge of it. And therefore, we are happy to look at manufacturing in the mature node. We call it the mature node. 28 nanometers, uh, 45 nanometers, 65 nanometers which will serve the mobile telephony, um, as a, the wireless telecom networks, automotive and the compute side right. to a large extent. Right. It will not 100%. Demand, yeah. So on the manufacturing packaging side, that is the play that we are uh, uh, looking at. We have a, we've got a number of proposals. They are being evaluated by an advisory committee. But equally importantly, we want to be significant players in the innovation side of it, design side. And the uh, Prime Minister, when he gave $10 billion for the semiconductor ecosystem, has set aside almost $200 million to fund startups in semiconductor design. The next generation of chips, whether they are for AI or whether they are for compute or whether they are for the mobile phone, we believe should come out of India, not by employees working for some multinational company, but rather from startups that are collaborating with the foreign company and either developing, co-developing the device or developing the device. So this is our overall Indian vision. Indian technology for the world. Exactly. Indian devices for the world or at best, uh, at worst, that we are prepared to accept 
co-owned device. So that is an India, US, and India, UAE co-developed uh, device for the world. This is our future roadmap. We are moving very uh, rapidly in that. Uh, in today's startup uh, conversation, there were companies who had come from India. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, Vishnu. One of the great deep honors and privileges of being a minister in this space is that I get to meet youngsters. And I visited 40 colleges in the last 16 months. The energy, the determination, the absolute perseverance that are there, that is there in this generation of young Indians. I mean, I wish I could say I saw that in my generation, but I'm absolutely clear in my mind that at least on the design, innovation, and the skilling side, we will certainly be world beaters very soon. One or two more questions. Now, social media is part of our lives. Yes. Um, but the fact of the matter is that there has been a, a raging debate in India about the number of takedown requests which the government makes. Now, there are for all sorts of reasons. But Twitter, for example, has taken the government to court. What they are saying is journalistic and political content is uh, being targeted and that there is no rationale given for takedowns. I know we are a large country. Yeah, yeah. But is no, that explanation? So, so first of all, I want to correct the myth that we are some great takedown nation. <laughs> we are 800 million Indians online and our percentage of takedown requests is a fraction of what Germany does or US does. Or Japan any. does. Uh, yeah, as a percentage of total users. So, the, if you just use an absolute number, it will look large, but effectively it is a large base. Look, we believe very clearly that the internet is a force for good must be a force for good. However, it's very clearly told by our government repeatedly that there are three boundary conditions for anybody operating in the Indian internet. The internet must be open and i.e. bereft from any influence either state or enterprise wise. It has to be a safe and trusted place for our digital nagrik and every platform must be accountable to its user in a very defined uh, predictable way. So in that sense we are trying to create some boundary conditions around a space that has never had any regulation. And the reason it's never had any regulation is that for years, governments of the world were happy to consider these platforms as innovators and not requiring regulation and not requiring oversight. And now we see that the internet, as much as it does good, it also does harm. No, but if, if the allegation is that journalistic and political content is targeted... Look, uh, so you're, you're, so, so let, example, me, let me respond to the Kashmir Twitter. Word, word, word look, question. look, in the India... The farmer agitation, people, you know, I mean, there were Vishnu, issues, you take down yeah, requests, yeah, yeah, etc. That's et fine. Vishnu, I, I will not comment on anybody's petition. Every, we are it's a democracy, a so uh, rule of law applies. They are free to go to the courts and say what they have to say. But I'll tell you the facts. The reason they filed that petition so long after and not at the time of the, that is the question you should ask them, how come you did not file this petition at the time when the takedown notice was directed at you? They did not. They did this only when we sent a notice to them of non-compliance under the law for a certain set of other things. The intermediary issue. Yeah. And so on the face of a non-compliance notice that was sent by the government of India to them, they rake up an issue of 14 months ago and make a case that we are uh, trying to infringe on their right. We are not doing any of that. And in any case, with the Twitter files that have come out today and the absolute uh, evidence of the misuse of that platform, I think more and more answers, questions will have to be asked of them and answers provided. What are you specifically concerned no, about? Look, and do you believe there needs to be an alternate to Twitter? We have Ku, for example, which is I, Indian. I, is that, I am not, are you going down that? I am not, no, no, not at all. I will not, uh, I, we are a government. We don't necessarily want to play God in terms of who's the platform and who's not. But we certainly expect all the platforms to conform to the rules and comply with the rules of and the laws of India. That is absolutely non-negotiable. And to, to hide behind some imaginary guidelines or community guidelines that has been merrily flouted by our own management is not something that we will accept anymore. We have said very clearly and I have said recently that the weaponization of misinformation is a clear and present danger to safety and trust on the internet. And that is something that we will very, very closely examine. Nobody should be able to weaponize the, inter, uh, the uh, weaponization of uh, yeah, the misinformation. But then the allegation is that that weaponization see, look, includes people, for example, affiliated with political parties, including I, your own. So my I point, mean, we are trolls of no, all no, parties. No, no. So therefore, I think it is important. Will that end? No, no. So Vishnu, I think it is important for us to come to a consensus. 
regardless and not look at everything through a prism of politics that the internet is an internet for 1.2 billion 1.3 billion indians and that it should be a place where safety and trust comes first right and therefore if there is anybody regardless of the political complexion of that particular weaponization or that particular misinformation we should crack down on so that so all trolls have to go i, I did not say trolls i said I'm, misinformation I'm no 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 But that no, is misinformation. I don't mind if you and I, if you and I enter into a legitimate no, no, debate, a, a debate where you troll, thing. you 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 are sarcastic against me. No, no. Trolling, right. look, trolling is too large a word to be defined under law. Right. Trolling could be, I say, I don't like your tie. But when 500 people jump on, or 1,000 people jump on to one person, yes, and sort of target them over their views, it's it's it, yeah. It, so it, it's therefore, true. therefore, cyber bullying. these are all important issues of user harm that will now be in a new bill that is called digital india act that is going to supersede the it act which will be out for public consultation where an individual feels safe and trusted he does not worry about being doxxed or gaslighted he is not a young girl she is not a young girl who is going to be uh, abused online these are all legitimate expectations for a democracy like ours that the internet must be safe and trusted for the young girl young boy student the elderly pensioner the woman housewife and the young professional uh, person the internet cannot be right. a place where toxicity trumps everything right. regardless of where that to is that how you see the internet and i absolutely right now, clearly toxic space i see the internet today as being made toxic with weaponization of misinformation and i am not get commenting on where it comes from but i think it is time as we move into the india decade that the internet represents a force of good and remains a force of good for our 1.2 billion indian uh, digital nagrics super thank you so much thank for you, speaking Vishal. to us thank you so there you have it mr rajiv chandrasekhar at the india global forum i think we've spoken about everything we've spoken about employment we've spoken about technology we've spoken about social media as well as also forthcoming legislation and what it means to more than 1.2 billion indians in our country back to discuss